the Paul Leslie interviews. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to welcome our special guest, the one and only Tony Butala. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's great to be with you very much. Uh, that introduction is overwhelming. I'm not used to being introduced that well. It is great to have you here. Who is Tony Butala? <laughs> Tony Butala is the eighth child of 11 children born to Mary and John Butala in Sharon, Pennsylvania, in a five-room house in a poor area town, who was born with love and respect in a musical family who was very, very loving of his family and very gracious and very glad and blessed to be where I am and who I am in the family that I was born into. What was life like growing up in the Butala household? Well, you know, this was in the 40s and before television, and my mother was without a lesson when her father finished the, helping build the Croatian church in Farrell, Pennsylvania. She was assigned to be the organist at a 16-year-old girl, and she played the organ without at one lesson. And when my dad walked into the church at about 17, 18 years of age, he uh, saw the, the girl playing the organ, so he immediately joined the choir. And so my dad and mom were singers, and the whole family was, were, entertained each other, and we had a loving time. We just uh, sang around the dinner table. We were very poor. We used to listen. We used to watch the radio and all the hit parades, shows, the musical shows. And so we sang in church. It was just a, one of the most wonderful childhood I can imagine. We were, lived a half a block from the Shenango River, and the woods were behind our house. And it was like a Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn lifestyle. And I wouldn't change it for the world. And I slept in the same bed with my three brothers until I was 10 years old. So, as you can imagine, my three brothers and I are very, very close. Hovering around the radio, what did you like to listen to? Well, my mother used to take the four of us boys on Saturday mornings to keep us occupied from the fields and the river and the boats and the, the rafts and take us to the movies. And I remember going to the uh, theater in downtown Sharon, Pennsylvania, Columbia Theater. We'd watch the Roy Rogers shorts. They were about, you know, 30, 40 minute short subjects where the guy with the white hat always wins. And Gene Autry. And the thing that astounded my mother when we walked out of the theater with her four boys, I would be the only one who actually started singing the songs that I just heard Gene Autry sing. And they couldn't believe, I guess I have a photographic memory for music. I can't even add two and two, but as far as music is concerned, so that, the old, See them tumbling, tumbling, tumbleweeds was my very first favorite record. Out of the range will be found, deep in the da da deep the tumbling, tumbleweeds. I can't remember it now, but when I was five and six years old, I, I that was our first song I used to sing. It sounded my family that I had a knack for music. And you were called from a very young age, Sharon, Pennsylvania's Al Jolson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, in those days, you know... I, the, how I got that title was, was so precocious in first grade. My three older brothers were stair steps one year apart, and they used to rank on the school that, oh, man, you don't want to go to school. It's horrible. So I heard that for four of my brothers going through first grade. So by the time I got to first grade, uh, they couldn't find me. I was two fields away in the top of the tallest oak tree hiding from everybody because I didn't want to go to school. When I did get me in school, I couldn't keep attention. So... My mother was told I just had too much energy. So she enrolled me in a dancing school. I was the only male dancer, the little boy dancer, in a class of three, 30 girls. So when they had the little recitals at the end of the year to prove to the parents, mommies and daddies, what their 25 cents a lesson was going for, or tw I think 25 cents, because I was the only boy, the dancing teacher made me the production singer. So I'd sing, and all the little girls would dance around me. So after the recitals, I stopped the show a couple times, Either I was such a great voice, or most of the audience was my relatives. <laughs> so I started getting calls to do shows for the Elks, the Moose, the Lodge, the Rotary, the Knights of Columbus. So I developed this little act, and Alex Olson was very big in the 40s. So minstrel shows were still going strong, and my father was in a minstrel show with, the, you know, the black face and men. So they got me a little kinky black wig over my blonde hair, and my mother put burnt cork on my face. And I used to do a little tuxedo with white gloves and impersonate Al Jolson and 
Ted Lewis and Eddie Cantor, and I, I developed a reputation for my show. And I had a piano player, and I had charts, and at seven years old, I became a professional singer. And my biggest deal was singing Mammy on my one knee as Al Jolson, because there wouldn't be a dry eye in the house. So when I went to KDK uh, radio station in Pittsburgh, which is about you know, 60 miles away, I got on a local show there every Saturday morning called Starlets on Parade. I was featured about once a month. So like my fame grew for like 17 states around. And so at 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, I became a you know, very well-known professional singer in western Pennsylvania and Ohio and in New York. So I went to a trip to California, and I auditioned for the Mitchell Boys Choir in 1950. And lo and behold, I got the job as being one of the Mitchell Boys Choir, and I started doing motion picture work and television work and recordings, and that's kind of how it all started. You had this radio show from a very young age. Tell us about that. Well, it wasn't my show. I was just a guest on the show. Ed Chauncey was the uh, you know host, and Betty Dugan was the musical director. And it was wonderful. The see, radio had live audiences and big studios in that day, because it was before television. And so I loved the fact to be in front of people and realizing I had the power to make them cry or laugh. When I would do Mammy, you know, it's a very sentimental song. You know, I'm a-coming, sorry that I made you wait. Mammy, I'm a-coming, you know, it's your little baby. And I I guess with the black face on, I was kind of camouflaged, and I could let my personal feelings out in the lyrics of the song. So I learned at a very early age that you've got to do more than just sing songs on stage. And that's what I brought to the Letterman. I'll tell you what, there are two two types of recording acts, Paul. There's the recording artists, and then there are entertainers. The recording artists maybe didn't have a chance to go play toilets when they're young little funky dives in clubs and never got their sea legs learning how to entertain an audience without the benefit of a hit record. Well, what I'm talking about is entertainment. They're like Sammy Davis Jr. He only had a couple of hits. who's one of the greatest entertainers in the world. Wayne Newton only had one major hit. He's one of the greatest entertainers. But now the general public seems to, they don't have the semantics right sometimes. They think just because you record a hit record, that makes you an entertainer. No, it doesn't. It makes you recording artists. So when people sometimes pay big, big bucks, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 bucks, they go to see what they think is an entertainer, but it's only a recording artist standing on stage, not re- not reflecting with the audience, not interacting with the audience, not really entertaining, just standing on stage singing one, two, three gigantic hits in a row, the general public realizes that's not entertainment. So often now some of these recording artists, they go with a troupe with big trucks and trusses and elevated stages and, and laser beams and smoke bombs and, and eight dances behind them. And I guess you can call that certainly a type of entertainment. Well, the artists, even the recording artists may not even be singing live, because they're dancing around. That is a form of entertainment, but not the true entertainment that I'm talking about, like Bill Cosby walking on stage with a chair and a microphone can keep a 10,000 audience enthralled for hours. So that's a different form of entertainment. So what I bring in, the, what the Letterman have brought for 50 years is that type of entertainment. Tell us about the Mitchell Boys Choir. It was the greatest experience of my life. They're 10 years old, 10 and a half. I was in the Mitchell Boys Choir in Hollywood, that Bob Mitchell started the Boys Choir in 1932, and it lasted through 2000. And Bob Mitchell just passed away a couple years ago at 96 years of age. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Boys have been in over 300 motion pictures and television shows since the 30s. Some of the big movies that Bob Mitchell and the Choir Boys were in before me was Going My Way with Bing Crosby and Barry Fitzgerald, was it in Pale Face with Bob Hope, Angels with Dirty Faces with Edgar G. Robinson, the uh, Bishop's Wife with Loretta Young and David Niven. And when I was in the Boys' Choir, I auditioned out there, and Bob Mitchell has his own boarding school, his own teacher's private school, and it's a professional choir. And you learn to sight-read music as soon as you get in there the first three months. The reason that Bob Mitchell has been in so many movies is because the boys come to the studio prepared and disciplined. When you have the movie set going with hundreds of people, lighting and sound people and grips and dolly and cameramen, and little actor kids come in and they have their they climb the walls and they, they don't have their parts learned. Well, Bob Mitchell was a stickler for discipline and education and, and sight reading music. So that's why he got so many roles. Anytime you see a group of kids in a motion picture, it's usually the Mitchell Boys Choir because they don't 
waste time and it'll cost money that could be spent. So uh, when I was in the Boys Choir, we did uh, On Moonlight Bay with Doris Day and Gordon McRae. I was in that movie. I was in War of the Worlds with Gene Barry. I was in you know, that great classic animated cartoon, Walt Disney, Peter Pan. I was in the voice of the Lost Boys in Peter Pan. You know, we're following the leader, the leader, the leader. And then, of course, White Christmas. Dean Crosby, Rosemary Clooney, Danny Kaye, and Vera Ellen. We came in at the end of the movie and sang the finale with them, White Christmas. Big thrill. So we're doing television shows and motion pictures and, and singing in 17 different languages and all the various church services. And every time we sang at a funeral, we got a certain amount of money. I was weddings, you got a certain amount. And but when I ever did the movie or television, I was a member of AFTRA when I was 10 years old, Screen Actors Guild when I was 10. So it was an all-around, from a little kid from a small town in western Pennsylvania, one of 11 children, be thrust out in that life in Hollywood. It was really eye-opening experience and gave me a good perspective. We're talking with Tony Butala of The Letterman. Tell us about the Newcomers of 1928 review. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's a transition for me. After the boys' choir, I was an ugly, awkward adolescent with pimples with a cracked voice because I lost my voice, soprano voice. Because, you know, when boys turn 14, something happens to them, and they no longer are boys' sopranos. So Bob Mitchell sent me to Hollywood Professional School because they had the same hours of classes, only four hours a day, than his private tutors. So he only went up to the ninth grade. I was assistant choir director, and so he sent me to this private school, and there I met my school place classmates, all professional people, Bobby Driscoll, Molly B., Brenda Lee, Jill St. John, Jimmy Boyd, Venetia Stevenson, and a little girl by the name of Conchetta Ingolia. Conchetta and I, in high school, the private Hollywood professional school, started a vocal group called The Four Most. It was a really hip name for a big band jazz group. It was Conchetta Ingolia and three, myself and two other ex boys. We were doing big band arrangements, jazz arrangements, and all of a sudden, after three years, Conchetta came to me and said, Tony, uh, that's 57, Rock is coming in, big bands are going out, so I think I have a chance to do this TV show. So she changed her name to Connie Stevens and became Cricket on Hawaiian Eye. And that left me with just a male trio, and, and I said, I'm not going to buck the trend. I'm not going to continue doing big band and jazz vocals. So that's when I came across the idea to do a cross between the big band groups, and the rock and roll groups. So that's when I started The Letterman. When we were The Letterman, not doing anything, but a couple of years before we recorded, there was a troupe, a, new, a show going into Las Vegas called Newcomers of 1928. Now, that was a throwback to the days of the 20s and 30s. And, you know, Las Vegas didn't really get its big name till after the war, in the 46, 48. All the acts that Sinatra and Dean Martin, all the Rat Pack and the people, Frankie Lane, that were work in the Vegas in those days, were all newer, younger people. Well, Jackie Barnett put this review together to give the old-timers a shot in Vegas. So it was a retro review that in 1958, we opened on stage February 28th at the Desert in Las Vegas. You know what happened in 57? Sputnik was launched. So Sputnik being launched in 57 opened the space age. So Jackie Barnett wrote this show for Vegas where the spaceship of... <laughs> a paper mache rocket ship on stage, and the dancers and singers were going to the moon, we're going to the moon, going to the moon. And then this, the stage dance pulled this rickety rocket ship up into the wings, and then there's a scrim on the back of the screen, and it showed the Earth on the lower left and the moon on the upper right, and this little cartoon spaceship is making its way up to the moon. Then it goes around and in the, gets caught in the atmosphere of the moon. It goes around in circles and faster, 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 and is shot back to Earth, and that took it back in time, and it crash-landed back in 1928, from 58. And that's when the review started with Paul Whiteman and his orchestra on stage of the Desert Inn conducting Rhapsody in Blue, which is the biggest record ever in the history of man. And Paul Whiteman had more hits in the 30s and 40s than the Beatles did in the 60s. He was a big, big star. So in that review, in his segment, they had to have a group called the Rhythm Boys, which was a trio that had a lot of hit records with Paul Whiteman in the 40s. And so the, we auditioned for that part. And sure enough, we got it. And the Rhythm Boys consisted of Perry Barris, Al Rinker, and a little unknown singer at that time by the name of Bing Crosby. And I played the wow. Bing Crosby part. And that was our first gig in Las Vegas. And other 
was in that review were Buster Keaton, you know, the silent film comedian, rubber face comedian. I did a 15-minute skit on stage with him in a dueling scene with Paul Whiteman for a year in that review. Harry Richmond was in there, the old Bonneville guy. Rudy Valley was in that review, the megaphone singer. And Fifi Dorsey, another star. And so th- this review gave them a chance to play Vegas. It was so charming and so different that it was held over week after week and month after month. So a couple of years before the Letterman recorded, we were on stage in that review, entertaining without the benefit of a hit record. The first time the Letterman were in a recording studio and you listened back, did you feel like you all had something? No, we we, we liked the sound. No, I didn't think it was that commercial, because I had been recording on my own as Tony Butala in 55, 56, I had a couple singles out, with after Elvis came out, every little record company in L.A. wanted to find their own version of Elvis. So I recorded before, so recording wasn't anything new to me. With the Boys Choir, we did a Christmas album with Dennis Day when I was 12 years old. So the recording industry itself wasn't new. It was not like I started my group in high school and went to Hollywood and bam, we recorded. That would have been a big shock. But to me, it was just kind of okay. Oh, hum, it's another recording. But I liked our sound, the Letterman sound. We had a nice blend, but I didn't think we were commercial because rock was in pretty strong then, and we were trying to find a sound between folk and, and doo-wop and pop. And so our very first recording was Their Hearts Were Full of Spring with Warner Brothers. It was kind of a folksy song. So in 60, there were still some folk groups making it, Peter, Paul, Mary, Turning Them in the Kingston Trio. So what we did is... There's a story told of a very gentle boy and a girl who wore his ring. It was real pretty, folksy and harmony, so we thought it could have a chance. But sure enough, it was with Warner Brothers Records, and it didn't come making in the top 100 even. And then another record we did with Warner Brothers was The Magic Sound, which was a novelty song. And we, we thought that had a big chance, and sure enough, it bombed too. So it wasn't until the next year, 1961, that we recorded for Capitol, Capitol Records. It was a staid old record company from the 40s, and they just hired a new A&R man by the name of Nick Benet. Nick Benet, I knew when I was a recording artist on my own, he wrote a couple songs for one of my sessions. And so I, when he got with Capitol, I was surprised. And so I called him up and said, look, we have a couple records released with Warner Brothers. We heard the Capitol's looking for some new artists, so we sent our dubs over to Nick. He said, come on up. And so Nick even though we weren't contracted, he recorded us because he loved the sound so much. At the end of the session of the four preps, we did this this one ballad and the three up tempo doo wop songs. And the song that, that he liked was That's My Desire, which is a doo wop version of an old Frankie Lane song. And so Cal he got the capital to okay, let's sign these guys and let's let's put That's My Desire out. It looks like it's popular. It was to spend one night with you, we, you. It was strictly a sound of the times. So in those days, Paul, you could have a, a dual-sided hit, which means that either side becomes a monstrosity. East Coast might play one side, and the West Coast might play the other. You end up with two mediocre hits. So in those days, the practice was in the early 60s on a 45 to do one real strong song and put a real dog on the beat side. So no one would play it except the jukebox operators in bars, you know, Santa Mel song, a ballad. So we put this sweet, slow, dirgy, saccharine ballad on the B-side, knowing nobody in their right mind would ever play that in 1961, because it was a doo-wop rock heavy year. Well, sure enough, That's My Desire got in the top 40 and stopped dead. And all of a sudden, the disc jockey in Detroit, T.J. McCarthy, Turned the record over, because in those days, disc jockeys could play their own music. What they wanted, they could find obscure cuts on B-sides and on albums. So this disc jockey on WJR in Detroit played his dirty, sweet, saccharine, slow ballad. And sure enough, it was our version, The Way You Look Tonight. Because it was so different, it shot up the charts, it became our first hit record, that typed us being a slow, romantic ballad singing group. You're listening to our interview with Tony Butala of The Letterman. Just a moment ago, you mentioned the song, The Way You Look Tonight, and what followed that is a song everyone knows, When I Fall in Love. Well, they know it now, but back in the early 60s, 
both these songs were obscure. The Way You Look Tonight wasn't done since 1936. Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers sang that in a movie called Swing Time. So it was 36, 46, 56 to 61 before we brought it back and became a hit with that standard. And when I fall in love, since we had a hit with the ballad, Nick said, hey, let's do another old standard ballad. And this was not heard since 1952 with Nat Cole and I think Doris Day did it. So but since then, everybody and their brother has recorded it. Sinatra did a, a swing version of it just about 30 years later. So it, it proves that a good song is a good song. I mean, with lyrics like, when I fall in love, it'll be forever or I'll never fall in love. In a restless world like this is, love has ended before it's begun. How could you get any better than that? In your opinion, what makes a good song a good song? Okay, let's, let's talk about songs. There's a lot of good songs that don't become hit records. And they're still good songs. And there are a lot of hit records that aren't necessarily good songs. They're good records. They have, they have a novelty beat to them. The producer's great. The sound is great. Like, we were doing this album, a summertime album, and theme from a summer place was, you know, in that big movie, instrumentally by Percy Faith, we needed some a, a summer song. So we said, hey, let's put words to that one. And we wrote some words to it, and lousy words. And publishers said, no, no, we'll get one of our writers to write the words. So sure enough, we recorded as an album cut, just to be an album cut, a high falsetto lead, because I used to do the leads on most of our ballads, but Jim Pike had the falsetto. And uh, it's not a Frankie Valley before there was a Frankie Valley. So there's a summer place where it's a rain or storm. And I, we, we did it. And we said, oh, my gosh, that's kind of silly. And even though it was a kind of nice words, we didn't think it was – we were even not going to put it on the album. But we put it on the album at the last minute. Sure enough, we put the album out, and just jockeys start picking that cut out to play as a hit record. And I would have bet $1,000 if that wouldn't have even made the top ten. So this – when you get into discussing this and analyzing what's a good song, there's so many tastes out there. What I try to do is keep my taste open. The letter that have kind of progressed over the years, we've evolved. And we've never stuck with the same exact sound. We look at it as a business. Show business has two words, show and business. We are a product. First of all, we're not going to be a product that just sits out on that stage and sings like a lot of other acts, recording artists. We're going to get out there and entertain that audience. First of all, the concept of Letterman is three soloists. When I chose the two other guys in Hollywood, they're good-looking guys, handsome, but great voices, solo voices. Most group members start with one guy at a high school or a college with a great voice, and he goes to his buddies, hey, Sam, you sing bass. Why don't you join my group? Or, hey, Joe, you sing tenor. And the, usually most groups are one lead singer, and the guys behind them going, do wah, do wah, do wah. Well, I didn't want that with my group. I think I put the first boys band together. This way, in Hollywood, with a purpose and a plan. Three solo singers. But the problem with solo singers is that it's hard for a solo singer to have ego enough, less of an ego enough, to be a group singer and blend. I found a magic combination of three solo guys who still love to sing together. That made us a stronger group. The reason we went through all these periods of different types of music, you know, hard rock, punk rock, acid rock, every kind of and disco, the Letterman are a business. We are entertainers, first of all. And every year from the time I started this group, we look at ourselves in the mirror. Every January, what about our hairstyles? Is it too outmoded? Or is our wardrobe too updated enough? It's like Cadillac did with their cars. In the late 50s, they put fins on them because that's what everybody was buying. And so it's still a Cadillac. It's body by Fisher. It's still a quality substantive Identity. So that's what the Letterman are. If you look at our albums, you put all 76 albums in a row, CD slash albums. We all have our faces on the covers. So you can watch our hair grow on those three albums a year through the early 60s up to the epitome of 1979 and 80 when all three Letterman were on the album covers with, I had a curly, I call it a Hebrew afro, a curled head, and we, all three Letterman have mustaches and sideburns and goatees. And that, that was the pity that from then on, the hair got shorter again to today. So it's all an evolutionary process. If you want to be relevant and stay relevant, you've got to keep your product on the shelf. That It's got a wrapper that's going to be appealing to the public. So we don't, we're not, what the Letterman aren't are three pot-bellied, chubby old guys with 
balding crew cuts. That's not what the Letterman are. It's three viable, good-looking, in-shape guys that can come into your town and entertain you and do a show. I read where you said, one of our rules is to never dress below the level of your audience. Oh, yeah. Look, it goes along with what I was saying. The guys that get up there on stage and think that they've done their job by appearing, showing up, in torn jeans and t-shirts, it's kind of a hip, you know, the Marlon Brando, I guess, look at realism. And that's okay. Some people go to concerts like that, and they probably enjoy that time. But I'm talking about the Letterman perform at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City in our prime in 20 years of the, that showroom, the Empire Room, classic showroom in the country, or the Palmer House in Chicago, or the Roosevelt, uh, the uh, Blue Room, or the Roosevelt in New Orleans. That's the type of venues we were playing. And then, of course, we play state fairs in the summertime, and we play Vegas. So when we play Vegas, we had jumpsuits before Elvis had jumpsuits, for God's sake. And uh, glittery stuff for Vegas, I think you have to dress for your surrounding. When we do symphony orchestras. We have these very dignified tuxedos. And we play our regular concerts. We have casual dress or outdoor fairs. We have, you know, we're not jeans, but they're they're like $500 jeans. <laughs> and... And thousand dollar shirts, but casual shirts. But there, it's if you have respect for what you're doing and respect for yourself, I believe you have to have the respect for the audience and dress accordingly to make sure that they're paying to see you. You're not paying to see them. For here's the thing: it's A B C. A, the act gets paid to show up. B, the act works their buns off to try to get the response from the audience. C. They get the response and a paycheck. Some acts, and I'm not just saying some acts, some acts don't know their alphabet. They want to put C <laughs> before B. They want to show up, then they want to get paid and get the response, and then B, maybe they'll perform. See, you, we have not, not, got, not ceased to get a standing ovation in our 50 years. Because why? Because we work at it. We work at that audience. We involve the audience. We, we never judge our audience. We've never had a bad audience. Why? You see some of these recording artists that go on the Jay Leno show or the uh, David Letterman show, and they'll sit there in a conversation with them saying, oh, that was a lousy audience there, or they're much warmer in the South, or they, they're too sophisticated in New York, or whatever. These people are just putting a knife to their throat, proving that they're not entertainers. Because an entertainer doesn't judge an audience. An audience is a reflection. An audience is a reflection of what's happening on stage, period. We're talking with Tony Butala of The Letterman. As much as The Letterman changed through the years, you've also said that there were some things that you never followed, that the band always stayed clean. Right. I don't, I, I, I guess I'm a square. You know, from the very <laughs> beginning, I mean, I, we were never hip. I mean, I didn't think it was hip to do drugs. I thought it was stupid. I never smoked a cigarette in my life. My drug is wine, and it's a legal drug, and it's good for you. I've been drinking wine since I was like four years old. I helped my grandpa make wine right here. The house I'm sitting in right now is my grandparents' home in Sharon, Pennsylvania. And back, my grandfather came into this country in 1900 from Croatia. His father, before him, my great-grandfather, had vineyards in Croatia in 1875. And my grandfather planted his first vineyards here in this country, right here where I'm sitting, looking out the window at the vineyard place in 1913. And my uh, number eight of 11 children, and when my mother, when all the men were fighting the war in 1943, my mother had to go to, as Rosie the Riveter, all the women had to make the tanks and the, and the ships and the, and the airplanes. So I was the youngest, I wasn't in school yet, so my mother would drop me off right next door, across the alley, in my grandparents' home. So what I did was, all for five or six hours a day, when the other kids were in school, my mother was working, I would help my grandpa in the vineyard. I helped him plant grapes. I helped him prune vines. I helped him hybrid and graft. I helped him trellis. I helped him harvest. I helped him down in the cellar, down below where I'm sitting right now, making wine when I was three and a half, four and five. And some people from this country that don't understand the European ethics will scoff and laugh at them. Are you crazy? This country was founded by the Puritans, Paul. Everything was illegal back to when they founded this country. It was illegal to sing, illegal to dance, illegal to drink. And so with, there's a Puritanistic mentality that still permeates through a lot of our society where everybody judges everybody else. In Europe, hey, 
Do what you want to do. Just don't disturb me. I'll go to confession. You can go to confession. You know, I'm, God is our judge. I'm not going to judge you. So when uh, I was at six years old, you know, you get a little bit of wine, a lot more water. And as you get older, the, the wine increases and the water decreases. So by the time you're 13, you're drinking a glass of wine with your family at mealtime. And it's, it's, there's less alcoholism in Croatia and Italy than there is in this country. It's because hmm. people get used to it. It's not a big, big curse. My buddy said, hey, let's go behind the bar and here. I said, are you kidding me? Why should I sit here in the freezing cold with you guys trying to sneak a beer when I can be inside the house having a glass of wine with my family? See, it's taking a taboo away from me. So you don't abuse it. Part of food, part of life. And my three older sisters, they go around the house. They had a five-room house, two bedrooms, one bathroom. My old three older sisters, they were like 10, 10, 10, 9, and 8 years older than me. They go around the house without bras. My mother breastfed all of us kids. If Hugh Hefner would have been born in a European household, he would not have made a penny because over there, Playboy Club, Playboy Magazine would have meant anything. In this country, can you imagine a woman was sued about 30 years ago of indecent exposure at the LAX airport by breastfeeding her baby? Now, isn't that a crime? That's a sin. How corrupt and weird our, our society has gotten with these taboos, these old puritanistic attitudes. I'm getting way off the subject, aren't I? This is an open forum. I invite you to talk about whatever you like. Thank you. Going back to the letterman, was there a certain time when you looked around and you realized, wow, we have really made it? Well, yeah, I, I guess I, I don't think we ever got big-headed because we kept each other in check. Two other guys in the original group, they're really down-to-earth guys. Bobby Ingeman was a wonderful fellow, and Jim Pike, was his father was a country singer. So we had been around the show business a lot. And I think when we did, I don't think it was the Ed Sullivan show that brought it home to us. It was, I think we did a show with Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason was doing this show in Miami. Uh, it was a DCC rally in 69. Jim Morrison had been there with the Doors six, eight months before. And he dropped his trousers in front of his, of his uh, audience of young people. He did some indecent things during the show. So the city of Miami had a decency rally, and none of the rock groups really wanted to attend. This is in the height of all the drug scene and cocaine and marijuana. So the only people that responded beside lesser acts was the Letterman, Jackie Gleason, and Anita Bryant. And Jackie Gleason was supposed to close the show because he was Mr. Saturday Night. And it was in the Orange Bowl. And the Orange Bowl holds about 100,000 people. And, of course, you fill the football stadium, put the stage at one end, and it's about 105,000. There was this, was this big decency rally that we were going to do. And uh, Jim Morrison subsequently passed away in France of an over overdose. Jackie Gleason was supposed to close the show. Letterman had a number one record, so we were supposed to be right before Jackie. And Anita Brown was right before us. Well, when Anita Brown was on, Jack, after we had all done our sound checks, and Jackie heard us sing, and he's with Capitol Records also as an orchestra, so he knew the Letterman. Appreciate our music. He came to me when in the Bible. So I said, "Guy, do you mind, Tony? If we, I, I got an early flight tomorrow. I've got a private plane. I want to be in New York. Can I go on before you guys and you close the show for me?" I said, "Well, gee, it, uh, sure, of course, whatever you need." And so he went out there, and I've never seen anything like it. It was like it could have been on the moon. A hundred and four thousand people were totally dead quiet with respect. You could hear a pin drop when he walked out. He said a few words, conducted his orchestra, tweeted his song, told a couple jokes. And then before he left, he said, ladies and gentlemen, we're here to prove the decency in our entertainment field. We don't want some of these people to break down our name and bring it to the gutter like some, entertain some recording artists do. He said, coming out next, I want to introduce you to three young men who are the epitome of class and culture. And he said, this being an entertainer is just as valuable as being a brain surgeon or an attorney or a doctor. And these young boys epitomize all this in entertainment. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the letter. That, well, to me, a... was when I feel we're established. That is quite a compliment. One of the things about the lettermen is through the years, they shared the bill with some very, very exceptional acts. Bing Crosby, Sam Cooke, Dean Martin, George Burns, Sammy Davis Jr. Is there one that sticks out in your mind 
Yeah, there are all the steps. And let me just say, preface one thing. And when I get questions like this, I like to preface them, semanticize them, make sure we're all talking about the same thing. First of all, we're all human. None of us are right. saints. Everybody has good days and bad days. But the general public out there seems to want to fester around all the negatives. So the Letterman never got press and media because we're too squeaky clean. We went to, after the number one record in the country. We went into New York uh, with our uh, personal manager and our publicist, and this girl is the editor of Keen Screen Magazine. And and our publicist said, you know, you promised us that when you have the hit record, you put the Letterman on your cover. This girl was about 300 pounds, and I swear she had a, a box of bonbon candies on her desk. And she said, look, I, this magazine is 25 cents. That was in the 60s. We sell to a lot of the little girls in Des Moines, Iowa, and, in you know, south in Alabama. And, look, everywhere, these girls that pay 25 cents for the magazine, they don't want to buy a magazine to read about the boys next door. They want to read about the bad boys. They want to read about the stimulation. So we never really get press media. So it seems to me that only the squeaky wheels get the get the grease. The, the general public out there, they would rather, when I think Red Skelton is one of them, nicest man I've ever met. He also does have a squeaky clean reputation. Frank Sinatra was another one. One of the nicest, most humble, kind, in the millions of dollars philanthropy. But guess what? He got slammed because during his second marriage, his anniversary, he was in a beautiful uh, restaurant in Beverly Hills, and this guy, paparazzi guy, this is before they were called paparazzi. There weren't many of them. But the guy followed him around with those, you know, those big cameras with a big flash bulb on the top, and followed him around all day and a couple of days stalking him. Well, finally, this guy found out where he was having his first anniversary in a quiet booth at Mateo's in Westwood. Frank was in there with his wife of year anniversary. This guy comes up to the booth. He got in the back room somehow. He wasn't supposed to. And he, Mateo would keep all the amateurs out of the back. Only the celebrities would get in the back room to be quiet and away from the crowds. Well, this this guy broke through, came up to the table as Frank Sinatra was toasting to his lovely bride of the year with a beautiful glass of wine. The guy right in front of him and blinds them with his big flash camera. Well, Sinatra said, I had enough. He reached over and got out of his booth and said, look, buddy, I'm kind of a quiet guy with my new one. Bam! He threw him down, pushed him away. Well, that got all kinds of press. The guy sued him. So Sinatra gets named as a bad boy out of one instance in one time with one obnoxious photographer. So prefacing what I'm saying, so who's the nicest guy, they were all nice. I've never, and when you have an entertainer, I don't know what they're like with their wives and kids at home. I mean, Bill Cosby was so nice to my kids. They'd be backstage running through the halls between his dressing room and my dressing room in Vegas. He was so kind and patient with them. I mean, I can just tell you good things about people. I don't say, but probably universally, Consensus is that Red Skelton was probably one of the nicest men in show business. Why do you think the Letterman have hung in there for so long? Because we have a show number one. We change our show number two. We stay relevant in our dress codes. So the people in 19... Here's the thing I like. People ask. They come up to the autograph table after the show. That's another reason we're around. We've signed autographs, Paul, after every show. Every show. For 50 years... My autograph is probably the most worthless autograph in the world. Guy, I'm a coin collector. I'm an anesthetist. I'm a philatelist. The valuable things are the ones that's not very many of. Many and so I get millions and millions of autographs, so they're worthless. But one more thing I'd like to tell people, Paul. Let me ask you a question. What would you say if I told you I've never signed an autograph in my life? Would you think that's kind of strange? Would I think it was strange? Yeah, I ne- I've never, I'm telling you right now, I've never signed an autograph in my life. I would think it was strange for an entertainer, yes. I've never signed an autograph. I've written notes to people. Ah, uh, I see. So it's always been a personal experience. Yes. But one of us, an autograph, the first guy puts, what's your name? Sally, Joe, Joe. Uh, then he puts best wishes. And the next guy, he puts his name on. The next guy says, it was nice meeting you. And then it goes down to the third guy. All three of us autographed everything. And so another answer to that is this. We take pictures with people in our audiences. At every show, we have a camera song. Now, let me ask you another question, Paul. Why do you think that the signs on auditoriums, performing arts centers, saying, no cameras allowed? This is just a guess. 
It could be that the management does not want the fans to make money from selling the photos. Well, that's that's a pretty good answer. Well, back in before people start doing merchandise, there were still signs and people when some little rock act, for example, kids from high school or college get a big hit record. They have a couple. They go to performing arts there. My daughter was a ballerina. Here's the real answer. My daughter was a ballerina, and if she did a nutcracker or something, she's doing tours of days in front of the stage. If someone were to flash, she'd lose her sight line on the side of the stage. She could possibly trip and fall in the orchestra pit and break her leg and ruin her career. So in the old days, when flash photography came, they had to put those signs out there to protect the dancers, the ballerina, the ballet, and some operas had, you know, things. And if you're, you're some actor bearing a very dramatic rendition of the old man in the sea, like you're, uh, you're one of these readers, then a flash would break the mood. But for most of us, we're all court jesters. We're just there having a good time with our audience. So what difference does it make if people have flashes in the audience? So whenever we, for the last 50 years, we've had, when we come to these auditoriums, we tell the ushers, take those signs down. Put them up for anybody else, but we, we encourage people. We encourage people to take pictures. Now, that was fine for the first four years, but the last ten years, we've had to be much more discerning. We've had to have the ushers look around because, see, I'm, I'm a songwriter. I've written about 250 really lousy songs in my life, ten good ones. But there are songwriters out there that are great songwriters and publishers. If we, we don't mind people filming or audio taping or videotaping us until about 10, 15 years ago, when these things could be put up on YouTube and the person that wrote that song and the person that published that song aren't getting anything for their work. They aren't getting paid to do that show. So it's a copyright infringement. Well, so now we still always allow clam, uh, cameras flash, but there's absolutely no audio recording or visual recording of our show. So when people take pictures on stage, we have a camera song. I can tell you, for 50 years, I've been in people's homes where they've taken pictures of their dens and living room, and they have a picture on their fireplace, above their fireplace in their living room, in the place of honor, a picture of the father when he was young with singing with the letterman. And that's another reason why we're still around. We're very user-friendly. People bring their cameras. They can take as many pictures as they want. We have a camera song on stage. And then after the show, we're the last ones to leave most auditoriums. We're, we're there to the very, to the janitors. They packed up the stage. They've packed up all the instruments and the sound system. We're there to the last person is satisfied. We do autographs first, and then we take photographs individually if they want with anybody who cares enough to stay around. And then here's proof of the pudding. We have a stack of our addresses, our email address, and our office address, snail mail address. We tell people, look, the photo you take with us tonight, you can blow it up, whatever you want. You send it to us in a self-addressed envelope, and we'll autograph it and send it back to you. That's another reason we're still around. We're very user-friendly. When you think about all of the songs that you perform, is it possible to pick a favorite? I've got four children and five grandchildren. I couldn't pick a favorite. I, I do have a sentimental favorite song, and that is The Way You Look Tonight. Because after trying, since I was a professional singer at seven years old, I didn't have my first hit until I was about 18. So I was, I was in a lounge group before the Letterman after my solo career doing some singles. And I was with a group called Eddie Lawrence and the Whatnots. I was a bass player, a singer in a group called the Whatnots. I was a Whatnot. We were playing at a lounge, a funky lounge in Canoga Park, California, in the San Fernando Valley. I lived in North Hollywood. And the Letterman was a side thing I was doing after our stint in Las Vegas to record. We recorded, and sure enough, Capital put it out, and the side became the big hit. And but I, with four people you heard on the radio, I was playing a radio station on my car, driving to work to be five sets with this funky, smoky, alcoholic lounge with the whatnots. And I heard the announcer say, "Ladies and gentlemen, for your votes, our pick hit record of the week. And we predict this is going to go on number one to the rest of the country." And then he started playing the first few bars of "The Way You Look Tonight." Now, I was in LA traffic on the freeway, on the Ventura Freeway. When I heard those first couple notes, I realized this was going to be a hit record. I was so emotionally strained, I had to pull off the freeway, park my car, and I proceeded to cry my eyes out. I believe a cappella is three-part harmony. We have to sing in tune for three minutes without reference to a pitch. 
And then I love seeing Shangri-La because there's an instrumental in there that we're, we're holding our notes. The trumpets come, surround us, soar out of us, and we soar out of the trumpets. That's a goosebump time. So I've got several favorites, but all-time sentimental favorite would be The Way Looks Tonight. What is the best thing about being Tony Butala? Well, a loving family, support. i got my four kids, five grandchildren, and I made a living, put all four of my kids through college uh, on my being a letterman. I've never worked a day in my life because people, don't, don't tell the promoters this, Paul, but they weren't paying me to, to let me do what I'm doing. I would pay someone to let me do what I'm doing. It's such a great, I had a paper out here in Sharon, right on the same street that I'm looking out. I had Lincoln Street, Wilson Street, and uh, the State Line Road. Sharon's right, right on the Ohio border. And when I went to California at 10 years old, I was bragging to my friends in, in the choir in Hollywood there, on the motion picture lots. I was bragging to my buddies in the choir. I said, you know, I used to have a paper route. I delivered papers in two states at the same time. Ohio, I passed one to Ohio side, one to the Pennsylvania side, kept walking down and throwing papers on the porch. That was a big deal to me. I think simple things make a lot of sense to me. I, I've, you know, I had big houses and big cars and stuff. I, I bought a ranch, a horse ranch in Napa Valley, and I was very proud. I created one of the finest vineyards in the Napa Valley, and I think my grandfather, my great grandfather, would be proud of me. From a horse ranch, I've got, I've got some of the best Cabernet and Merlot grapes in Napa Valley. My, my wine is called Castlebrook Wines, and it's on the website. I'm, my Merlot 08 Merlot is coming out, and every time I Make, made wine, planted every, I have, you know, 52,000 grapevines up there. When I planted every one of them, the first, first row of each one I planted, I thought of my grandpa and how proud he would be because of my voice. The last question I have is very open-ended. For anyone listening, wherever they are, what would you say to them? Well, I'd like to say that we got to keep our minds positive. Let's keep our politics and our lives out of the gutter. And let's try to elevate our humankind around us by keeping good, good vibrations going, whatever we do, whoever we meet. Will Rogers said, I've yet to meet a man I didn't like. The reason he said that is because if he felt that in his heart and his mind, he would put that vibration out. So people he'd meet would get that positive vibration. And they, you, when you get positive, you, you get more with honey than you do with vinegar. If you give a loving feeling out there, you're going to get it back. And I exaggerated on that. I said, I've yet to meet a city I didn't like. I've yet to meet a country I didn't like. I've yet to meet a state I didn't like. I've been all around the world. And instead of judging that country, I get a book, a translation book. I get on the street. I try to speak the language. Instead of this high attitude, the ugly American tourist, you know, we have an attitude in this country. We seem to want to judge everybody. Please, let's not judge everybody. Let's just live our lives as best we can. What is a guy that was beaten in California by the policeman? He said, can't we all just get along? Rodney King, remember that? Ladies and gentlemen, let's keep positive thoughts, keep love in our hearts, kindness to our fellow man. Let's just all get along. Well, thank you so much for giving so generously of your time and for this very informative, interesting interview. Paul, it's my pleasure to be with you. You asked some great questions, very thoughtful questions. Thanks for your time. We'll talk to you soon. In the future, anytime. No, no.